right? <coughs> Let me turn this on. Uh, I think we can get it started. Um, thanks for coming. Thanks for registering the course. And this is uh, the eighth year that I'm teaching this uh, uh, course. Uh, initially, it was starting from 2011, and, uh, and uh, my name is Yunlong Liu. Uh, I'm from the Department of Medical and Molecular Genetics. I'm also the interim director for the Center for Computational Biology and Bioinformatics. And I also directed the Center for Medical Genomics, which runs the sequencing core facility for, uh, for IU Medical School, okay? Um, just uh, before we get started, there's a, a few logistics. So the first one is about the time, it, and I think by now you probably know, it's the 3 to 4.30 p.m., uh, Mondays and Fridays, it will be in this room. Um, and uh, this is uh, actually the first time that we're breaking the course into two lectures a week. In the past uh, seven years, it was always uh, three hours straight on the Friday afternoon. And uh, it's brutal that for both the lectures and the students, and I decided to make the change a little bit this year. And uh, another major change I have made is uh, uh, I'm not teaching the majority of the course. I, instead, I'm going to be the, the, the course coordinator. Uh, I will still teach most of it. And the other course coordinator is Dr. Jill Reiter, and, uh, and uh, she, her office is uh, on, the, on the fifth floor. Uh, it's uh, HS5025, uh, uh, is that correct? Yeah. And um, so we'll go through that a little bit. Um, and then in addition to myself, and there's uh, many other uh, lectures as well, and uh, the name is listed, so we'll go through the course syllabus a little bit uh, so they know uh, what they are teaching. Uh, we will also have the a TA, which is Ed Simpson, Ed, okay? He will be the one to grade your homeworks, grade all the exams, so if you failed, and he is the one to be blamed. Oh or killed, um, so, um, well, probably not. So, so uh, but he will be uh, available to help you to address certain questions, so we'll figure out the logistics uh, and for, for him to work on as well. And uh, we do have the office hours, and I didn't tell Jill, but she, she figured out from the slides today. And that'll be Fridays uh, uh, in the morning. So, so if you have some questions, feel free to come. Uh, and that is uh, uh, the time that she will be answering questions. And we don't have textbooks um, because this is a really a fast evolving field and we have increased a lot of materials this year as well, as I mentioned to you in the initial emails. Uh, so it's a, it's a, there's no textbook for that. Uh, I want to briefly mention about uh, the course objectives a little bit. Uh, this is a course that is co-listed in two schools, the School of Informatics with the course number five. Nine zero, and then school for medicine with the course number seven eighty eight. Um, initially, I mean, I think it's still the case that there's a lot of hesitations from the students from the school of medicine, and with the assumption that I don't know too much math, I don't know how to do the programming, and uh, can I really survive? Or, but. Uh, as a matter of fact, that the School of Medicine students historically normally, normally do a little better for this. And, uh, and the reason for that is uh, the course objective is really not to teach you the math or the uh, programming skills. As a graduate level course, I don't really have the resource and time to teach you how to use the Unix system to run those uh, commands. Rather, uh, I'm trying to go through a little bit about uh, the, the basic assumptions of different algorithms to analyze different level of data. So understanding deeper about the biology is actually help. So basically you can see I'm writing here is uh, understanding the basic principles of next generation sequencing technology, including the basic biological applications. What are the biology we can use to, to uh, take advantage of this particular technology? The very basics in the data processing, and uh, some of the statistical and the informatic theories in data analysis, 
And uh, so in this part, I'm not going to expect you to know all the math part of it or deriving the, the math equation. Some of them can be very difficult. But instead, I want to introduce more on the advantages of limitations of different algorithms and the, the basic assumptions that are being built into those algorithms. So, so you want to know that one, I want to use this, and how do I interpret the data? So in, in terms of in the middle, how does mathematics magic works out? It will be great if you can understand it, but if it's not, you don't, if you don't understand it, that is completely okay with it, okay? And also the biological interpretation of the, the results. So that's uh, the course objectives. Now comes to the course evaluation, okay? The attendance is not required, you don't have to come. Uh, if you don't care about uh, the 10% of the quiz, which uh, will be randomly taken. And for me, that is a tool to making sure that uh, most people are attending the course. Um, and um, uh, we will have 10% for homeworks, and uh, that might require a little bit of computer practice. And we also will have the, the project and literature review, okay? So this year is, uh, it kind of is a historical year for us. We have 36 students registered for the course. And uh, when we do the uh, course project, and because we need to have the, the course presentation, so we, we are going to limit our uh, group. Uh, I mean, we cannot do 36 presentations for every student presenting their, their findings. Uh, instead, we are going to do the group presentation or group, group home um, um, project. So we will, I will announce the, the logistics for that part uh, in the later uh, lectures. Okay? And uh, so there is a few deadlines that are being fixed there, uh, including forming your groups and uh, fixing the topics. And the, 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 the day of presentation will be December the 7th, and the final report will be due on November the 30th, so before, one, one week before the presentation. And we also will have the uh, midterm exam that is October the 19th, and we'll uh, account for about 20% of the, the final scores. And then December 14th will be the final exam, which should uh, account for 30% of the uh, everything together. So let me show you a little bit on the uh, course curriculum, if I know how to do that. Okay, so you probably already see uh, different versions of this uh, on the uh, course website, but uh, in general, that will include a, a few components. Uh, the overall that include the, 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 the technology and the basics, so that would be the first of four lectures. And then after that, we will have a few sections on the, on the tour of the CMG labs and, uh, and the introduction for the IO supercomputer systems. And after that will be the second major component of the, the, the course will be the DNA sequencing part. So we will spend uh, a few lectures specific talking about how to do the DNA sequencing data analysis. Uh, the part I labeled as blue are the sections that I and added in this year. Okay, so there is uh, including the statistical genetics part of it, and the, the regulatory and ethics considerations in the next generation sequencing data analysis, uh, high throughput report assays, uh, and the cloud computing environment as well. And after fall break will be the midterm, and after that we will talk about RNA sequencing, uh, including several new topics like uh, deconvolution analysis, single cell RNA sequencing analysis, uh, and the co-expression analysis, the pathway, and the network analysis. Um, and then the last component of this will be the ChIP-seq, uh, attack-seq, and, uh, and uh, uh, chromosome uh, confirmation assays. So you, you can see that uh, there are a couple of new uh, components being added as well. Okay? So if you have any questions regarding the, this uh, um, 
uh, syllabus and uh, well, please let me know. And uh, this will also be announced in the uh, Canvas system, so you should be able to have the, the access to it. Okay. So now it comes to the any questions about uh, the logistics of the course. No question. That's good. All right. So. Uh, now I'm going to jump in uh, the lecture of today. And uh, so I basically I will talk about two major topics. The first one is uh, a little bit definition of the next generation sequencing technology. And the second one is uh, the platform overview, and uh, which include uh, the Illumina technology, which is absolutely the, the, the standard now for the next generation sequencing. And the solid 454, these are the two technologies uh, that is kind of already obsolete, but we will still have data coming out. So I want to uh, have a reference on those. And the Pacific Biosciences and Amproton and uh, Torrent technology and the Nanopore technologies. So the first uh, uh, part is uh, what is next generation sequencing technology? Just give a little bit overview, right? So we know that uh, the DNA is a blueprint of our body. It basically encodes everything of what the cells do. And uh, so but in terms of the organization of the DNA sequencing, and uh, it looks like uh, being shown in this figure, right? So you can see that uh, uh, there is a, uh, our body is composed of, of 23 pairs of chromosomes, 22 autosomal and uh, a pair of sex chromosomes. But if you really go into the detail of that, so you will see that uh, this uh, double helix and uh, and then there's a lot of ACGTs. So each cell uh, of our body have 46 uh, human chromosomes. If you put that into the, the linear scale, it's uh, two meters long. And uh, we have three billion letters, ACGTs, in our body. And, um, um, and, and there are about uh, anywhere 20,000 to 30,000 genes in our body. So, that, so our goal of uh, this technology is really trying to sequence uh, the DNA or potential RNA molecules. So we'll go through in the next lecture. So why we want to do the, the sequencing, right? So basically, this is the central dogma from DNA to RNA, from RNA to proteins. Uh, and those proteins will have function. And then we have transcription, we have translation. The nucleotide sequence, which we are going to sequence, will determine the orders of this amino, sequence, um, um, amino acid sequences as well. So further, we'll uh, decode for the protein uh, structures and functions. So the alteration of this DNA sequence have a lot of impacts in our uh, biology. So including if the, the amino acid, uh, if the nucleotide change happens in the protein coding region, it can change the, the protein sequences and then further change uh, the, the functions. So, but sometimes when the regulatory region, there is a nucleotide change, it can potentially also alter the gene regulation as well. So making more or less protein. So we do need to do a lot of sequencing. So before we get into the next generation sequencing technology, we want to mention a little bit about history of the sequencing. So we know that the sequencing is an essential tool in the molecular biology uh, to figure out the base pairs of the DNA sequencing. And, uh, and there is a lot of advance of this technology, but the, the major thing happens in 1970s, and that will involve this uh, chemical sequ based sequencing and also eventually based on the Sanger sequencing. The Sanger sequencing is still very widely used today, and uh, which we'll talk about in the later slides, uh, that this is uh, the base of the Illumina sequencing technology as well. Okay, so in addition to this sequencing technology, there is another jump in, in the year of 2000 or 1990s, uh, and that will be using the cDNA arrays or, or oligonucleotide arrays uh, to do the genotyping, to identify the SNPs, so which will go through uh, the, the theory of that part a little bit as well. So summary sequencing is uh, incredibly useful. I think uh, for most of the audience here, probably already know it, so I will just uh, very quickly go through it. Uh, the summary sequencing is basically using something called the DDNTP, 
and uh, it's, uh, it's uh, deoxynucleotides, but it's D deoxynucleotides. That will include the four types D, D, ATP, CTP, GTP, and the TTP. So you can see that uh, the, the, the formulation of this, uh, and the, the, the top one here is the normal DNTP. They, they, this is uh, the nucleotide in our body, and that is how it's being formed. But this DDNTP, the only difference is this. Uh, part, there is a, a changing from this uh, a hydroxy group into just a, a hydrogen. So it's OH become an H. And the, the change of this making the reaction cannot continue. So you cannot put another nucleotide after the current one. And that is kind of a stopper. And uh, that is the only modification for this DDNTP. So when we do the summer sequencing, the way to do that, it requires a bunch of stuff. It needs the, D, the template DNA, which you can see the template DNA is here, for example. This is the molecule we want to sequence. And then the next one is going to be the primer, and it will be just a very short allegal that targeting, pairing with the, the beginning part of this template DNA molecule. And you need the DNA polymerase. So basically, those polymerase will, based on this template, uh, and uh, putting one nucleotide at a time that are uh, following these uh, this sequences. So the next one here is A, because this is the T. And then after that will be G, C, 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 T, T, G, G. And uh, it's a pairing between A and T and the C and the G. So what you need for this reaction is uh, you need two types of uh, uh, nucleotides. One is the, the normal DNTP, so making sure that the reaction can still continue to do, to, to follow. And that will include a pool of normal nucleotides, so DATP, ACP, GTP, and, and NTP. And at the same time, what you want is a, a small proportion of labeled DDNTP. So these are not only the stoppers, but also it's labeled, so it's colored. You can visualize that with the, 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 the color. So what happens is for this particular nucleotide, now we are trying to sequence T, and then apparently another A will be put in here. Most of the A are the normal A, so that the reaction can continue. But a small proportion of that A is going to be labeled the DDNTP, meaning that that molecule will stop at this particular location. And that means that when you run it on the gel, it will be the shortest, so it goes to the fastest in the gels. So you can see that some of them, and, uh, and uh, it's going to go faster, for example, this one A goes to the really fast, and then the next bunch will be C, 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 it's supposed to be C, C, C. So you can see that this D, D, C, T, P is there, and then further uh, you can see, and then T and the G. So using this protocol by reading this, uh, this gel pictures of different uh, places, you will be able to figure out what are the original sequence of this temp DNA template. Okay, so so I personally have never done this. I mean, I have not done anything, uh, but uh, especially this. Uh, and uh, so what I heard is it's a very uh, uh, difficult. I mean, at least a very boring process, and you have to be in cold room and. Uh, and doing a lot of uh, uh, those uh, boring reactions. And then by the end of the day, you are going to get a, a, a sequence, uh, uh, probably a few hundred bases in one day, just one of those sequences. Okay? But nevertheless, this is, this is a, a very, very important technology that uh, eventually become the, the principles of Illumina sequencing technology that I will introduce a little bit more. So the next technology I mentioned a little bit is uh, the microarray technology. OK, how many of you have, have heard about this microarrays? Used that before? How many of you have used that? OK, yeah. Yeah, I got a few audience have, have used that. So let me introduce uh, very briefly what this technology is about. Okay. 
So the first of all, you are going to see this. And this is a, a flat surface, you will, but it's being separated into many different uh, small compartments. Okay. Each compartment, if I zoom in here, and it will become this. Okay, this corner become this. So you can see this uh, a, a few different grade. And within each grade, if you further zoom in, they are being uh, the, the same identical oligos for a, a few dozen bases of the same identical oligos. So those are the ones that uh, you are going to have the, the, um, the uh, hybridization will happen. So basically, the design of these oligos are depends on which part of genome you want to target. And if you want to target one specific part of the genome, you know what the sequence is, you just design the oligo that is a reverse complement to that. So you can see here is, so this is, a, let's say this is the targeting on gene A. And then in the experiment, so you can see there's a lot of other molecules which have a small red hat on that. That red hat meaning labeling. It can be anything. It can be fluorescent based labeling. It can be biotin. So it really doesn't matter, but it's labeling. So if this is a molecule that has this label, so you can see that this in this molecule and in this part, it's perfectly reverse hybridized to the, to the oligo uh, being designed here. And this is in the process, this is soon to be uh, hybridized to here. And this one molecule here, it represents a very different sequence. So the chance is it will go for somewhere else to be hybridized. So by the end of the day, we are going to detect the signals. So if this particular gene is expressed a lot, we supposed to catch a lot of oligos here. And that's why that you see there's many red hats in these regions. And then by the camera, you will be able to see, okay, this part expressed a lot because I detect a huge amount of signal. Where this part, I didn't detect anything because that particular gene did not express at all. And some other places may have a different level of this uh, uh, hybridization. Depends on how much that particular gene transcribed. Okay, so so this is uh, the microarray technology, which is uh, uh, well, I would say that super smart. That uh, it was invented somewhere in 1998 and uh, started to become commercialized uh, by the year of 2000. And uh, uh, there are a couple for uh, microarray manufacturers. I, I believe that Affymetrix is one of the main, main uh, major manufacturers. And the size of this uh, chip is just uh, the, your, the size of your thumb. And, and, uh, and sometimes they can put in many, many different uh, smaller compartments in, in those regions. Okay. But what I was talking about is primarily designed uh, for, the, for the previous one, for the gene expression arrays. So meaning that there is uh, the transcription level going on. And, uh, but we can also use the similar technology, the same biochemistry pr principle to do the SNP genotyping, to identify SNPs. So here is how you do that. Okay, first of all, SNPs is, uh, stands for single nucleotide polymorphism. It's the most common genetic variation in humans occur, occur every, uh, about every 1,000 bases uh, uh, once. So, but you can see here is, uh, uh, the, the design for this. So basically, if you look at this is uh, the DNA sequence of one part of the genome. And in this DNA sequence, uh, there is one nucleotide here can be variable, okay? It can be either A or G, okay? And then our job here is, uh, can we find out with one specific individual, whether you got A allele or you got a G allele, okay? So the way to do that is very similar to what I showed in the earlier slides. So basically you have all those uh, DNA oligos, as you can see, all the sequences are identical and they were reversely complemented to the reference genome, to the DNA sequence that, uh, that the common part of it. 
except for the middle part that the, the nucleotide we want to genotype, it actually has uh, four uh, possibilities, A, T, C, and G. So for each location, we will have uh, four probes to target on this region. Okay? So if the one specific individual is a, a, a A allele, is a, is a homozygous A, so both the two alleles in that individual is A, and then what you are going to see here is uh, this particular probe, the second probe, will be perfectly matched because this is a T, right? So you can see that uh, this part, AA, two alleles, they are all A, so you can see this part is being lightened up because uh, it will be perfectly hybridized to wherever we design. If it's uh, that individual, the allele is GG, okay? And then that means the third probe here is going to be lightened up like this. So you can see that uh, because uh, C and it will be perfectly matched with uh, G. And so that's why they are, they are going to align together. But if it's a heterozygous variance, you can see both the middle two is going to be lightened up. That is simply because of the, 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 the base pairing of those oligos. And then what happens is you take a very good uh, fine picture for your slides by looking at which part is being lightened up, which is not. By analyzing those imaging data, you will be able to figure out which is uh, what the, the, the genotype of this individual is. Okay? And then we can do this really in a high throughput fashion, like a, a we can do like for, for maybe so far that the Illumina array can, can help us identify over 2.5 million such, a, such type of uh, SNP low size in one chip. So that is uh, the throughput that we can put in. And uh, so microarrays, uh, they are extremely successful, uh, has been uh, the real power for, force of in the biomedical research for over a decade. And that there are many different popular applications, including the gene expression profiling, and that includes microRNA studies and splicing. DNA copy number variations, so so far it's still being used in the clinical applications. And then they can, we can use that to do the genotyping, which means to identify the SNPs. And there is also chip-chip assay that we can use to study the protein DNA or protein RNA interactions. So those are um, very, very important applications. But the good news or bad news for the arrays is uh, all these applications uh, is currently being, most of them are starting to become replaced by using the next generation sequencing technology, which gave uh, somewhat uh, uh, cheaper and uh, a much higher quality of data. Um, so, so that will because of the, the disadvantage of the microarray is uh, you, before you, you profile a signal, you have to design those probes. And that means you have to know the sequence to begin with to design the arrays. And in many cases, that's not the case for us. So we cannot design an array for a lot of applications. So another thing is even if you know the sequence, and uh, sometimes we cannot fit all the sequences of the human genome into the array. I think uh, Epimetrics, uh, at a certain point, uh, uh, attempt to put uh, the entire human genome in a set of microarrays, uh, and eventually they design a, a, a human array set that uh, includes uh, seven chips that were interrogating the entire human genome. And uh, the data is, uh, there are a lot of data being generated, but they're also very, very difficult to analyze. And we'll go through that a little bit later, but uh, uh, microarray technology also uh, suffers from higher noise because of the cross hybridization and the, and the nonlinear uh, signaling detection. So, so we'll go through that when we get into the RNA sequencing technologies. Okay? So if uh, in the exam, I'm asking you that what are the disadvantage of microarray technologies, and this will be a good answer to put in there, right? Okay. 
And uh, I'm surprised that nobody asked me in terms of uh, um, what are the exam format. Is that open book or closed book? But I, I can tell you that it's going to be closed book. And uh, it will be two hours for both uh, midterm and final exams. Uh, and in the very early phase, that uh, uh, for the first couple of years, I did an open book um, exam. And, and it turns out nobody can find the answers. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, that makes it even harder for the students to, to digest. And uh, I was trying to record all the lectures to be in the very beginning. Uh, and the, in the past, it was a, a technician come here every lecture to record it. But the problem is, um, uh, I, I, I let the students to take a look at that. And my intention was you can use this to study the materials after class. But I was seeing someone that was listening to my lectures during the exam. And I think that is too late to study at that point. Okay. Um, oh, yeah, another thing I forgot to mention that uh, we are doing the recording. Evidently, we are doing that. Okay. I will not guarantee it will be successful. Okay. And I will not guarantee it will be successful every single time. Okay. So you are still required to come here. So I'm not going to be held responsible if we fail the recording, if the cloud doesn't work, if I forgot to press the start. Did I, I hope I press the start for, for this one. Okay. So just a. Uh, okay. Now, uh, his history is gone. So let's uh, come into the next generation sequencing uh, part. Uh, so, so far that uh, what we can do is uh, not, uh, we, we don't have to deal with one nucleotide at a time to do the cellular sequencing. We don't need to predefine any microarray platform to target on the region we're interested in. Instead, we can do the sequencing. So, one can sequence hundreds of millions of short sequences in a single run, which will, I will give you some additional definition. And uh, here are the major technologies that uh, uh, we potentially will go through a little bit, including the Illumina technology, the Life technology, and which include both uh, solid sequencing and ion torrent and ion proton sequencers, and the Roche 454 sequencing. And now there is a BGI seq, which is a, a, um, a BGI stands for Beijing Genome Institute. Uh, that is uh, being a uh, developer based on the uh, complete genomics technology uh, and the uh, pack bio and the uh, nanopore technologies. So, so far that uh, the mainstream in terms of the sequencers who made it, and these are a, a list of the sequencers who made it, that made it. So a little bit about the keywords of uh, next gen generation sequencing technology. The first keywords is uh, sequencing. Okay, it sequences both the DNA and the RNA. Well, as a matter of fact, for most of the platforms, they only sequence DNA, but for some of the platforms, they can sequence the RNA molecule directly. Uh, but for the only sequence of DNA part, you can always convert the RNA into the DNA and then do the sequencing. So the second keyword is a short read. Okay, so this is coming a little bit unexpected. So you can imagine this is the DNA sequence, like say a 2,000 bases. You want to know what the sequence of this DNA is. It's unlike what we imagine the sequence from the beginning to the end. Rather, because of the technology limitation, for most of the platforms, especially so-called second generation sequencing technology, it can only sequence the beginning part of it. And depends on the platforms, it can sequence anywhere from 35 bases all the way to 300 bases into the DNA. And going further, they cannot do it. And each sequence is called a, a read, a sequencing read. In some of the cases, we can also sequence from both two ends. And that is called a, either paired end or mate pair sequencing. So we will have a little bit more definition of this next, in the next lecture. But there are some other sequencers, and a lot of people define them as a third generation sequencers. And they can sequence much longer rays, like a Pacific bio, bio, pack bio technology or nanopore technology. 
The third keyword of this is ultra high throughput. So we are not a sequence like a 300 bases, just by, I mean, done with that. Rather, we can sequence up to 10 billion of those small sequences in one instrument run. So for the students who register for the for the course, we can have a tour that I, I will we probably will show you some of the, the the instrument that is able to do that. Okay, so in the next components that I want to uh, talk about uh, the platform overview and the purpose of this part is uh, really not to let you to design a new sequencer. Rather, my intention is uh, I want to show you how these sequencers work so that uh, you, you, in your mind, it's not um, a black box. So it's not a magic. So there are very solid biochemistry um, principles that behind that. So we'll start from the first one, which is the Illumina sequencer. And uh, Illumina sequencing is absolutely the leading platform so far. And if you go to read the papers, uh, about 90% of sequencing project uh, or data is being generated by Illumina. And uh, it has two features, which we'll get in a much more detail. The first one is uh, the bridge amplification, and the second one is uh, sequencing by synthesis. So we'll, we will stop here now, but we'll come back to this point. The second uh, technology is called SOLID, and uh, at this point, it's already obsolete. And I think uh, uh, two years ago, in our center, Center for Medical Genomics, we have two solid instruments, and then we, sh we, sh uh, we retire them as soon as we could. And, uh, and uh, we probably was uh, uh, one of the last institutions that uh, retired those, uh, those technologies. But they generate absolutely amazing data sets. It's just uh, cannot compete with Illumina. That's um, how things work. And the third one I want to mention a little bit is the 454 technology. It was being purchased by Roach. Um, uh, it's uh, based on the pair sequencing technology, and uh, at one point it can sequence 400 to 800 bases. And uh, the reason I still want to mention about that is uh, it was the first uh, next generation sequencing technology ever being put on the market. And the, the first platform comes in 2006, 12 years ago. And uh, now they are being out-competed. I don't think there's any uh, platforms available for that. Next one is uh, Pacific Biosciences. And uh, this is a, a single molecule technology and based on nano, na, nano hole on the, on the flat surface. So we'll get into that uh, a little bit. And the, the nice feature about this technology is um, it can have a very, very long rates. So it's not only 300 bases or 150 bases. Rather, it can sequence a, a few hundred thousand bases by now. Uh, but I think the average is still about 20,000 bases. It's really, really long. Um, the next one is uh, also uh, we have that in our center is uh, uh, ion torrent or ion proton sequencers. And those are semiconductor based sequencing instruments, which I will go through the principle a little bit. And it does have a higher error rate, but uh, they were initially being developed uh, because they were trying to sequence faster. And uh, they were initially targeted as uh, the platform that will eventually. Uh, go for the clinical applications, and they, they have been. I mean, they have been, been into the clinical applications. And the reason that they have this proton sequencer and they were kind of useful, and the later, um, it's at that point, uh, uh, Illumina sequencers still take about two weeks to, from the beginning you get the samples to the time you get the data. But uh, for M proton, it was uh, two days, and it was a, a huge improvement. But I think now Illumina can get to it uh, as fast. And, uh, and also, I will mention briefly about these nanopore sequencers, which, uh, uh, as you can see, that from this uh, size, it's a, it's a very, very small size of sequencers. And everybody can purchase one and then 
to play with it. We will we'll get into a little bit more. So, so now let me explain uh, about the Illumina sequencing technology, which is uh, uh, the first one I want to mention briefly is the HiSeq 4000. And this is a platform that is available in our lab, uh, in the R3 building as well. And uh, so basically, um, it has this flow cell design. And each flow cell have eight lanes, okay? And then it can sequence anywhere from 36 base to 150 base. And it can sequence both single end, the DNA molecule from one end only, or you can sequence both two ends. And uh, in each lane, it gives you up to 400 million rays per sequencing uh, lane. And the, the specs, they will guarantee it give you 330 million rays. And when we do the data analysis, normally we will do the um, uh, multiplexing. So let me show you what the, the flow cell look like. I'm going to use this. Hopefully it works. Is that working? No. Maybe with certain angle. So you can see that uh, this is uh, uh, the flow cell, and then it has eight different lanes. And for this uh, platform, each lane is uh, independent uh, experimental units. And you can, you can do this. Um, uh, you can do lane one, put the human samples, lane two, mouse, lane three, bacteria. It's, it really doesn't matter. And, um, and each lane gives you about 330 million rates. And so this, I want to I, I often that, uh, uh, make a joke to our uh, technicians that what they are having here is about 2.5 billion summer sequencers were being put in this particular chip. And uh, that is the capacity that, that we have. Okay, so let's go to go back to our slides, and the, the next one is even more powerful. It's called the Nova Six Six Thousand, and this is also the platform we have in our lab. And uh, now I'm going to show you what the flow cell looks like, and it will be much bigger, look like this. So what I'm showing you here is um, is the the S4 chips, which is uh, their most powerful one. And this one chip uh, will cost us $28,000. So if uh, we fail the one run, and that is uh, pretty expensive. Um, but uh, it gives you about a, um, 10 billion sequencing run, reads, so that uh, each read is about 300 cycles. So it's really, really powerful. Um, this one can give you about 12 whole genome sequencing. Um, is that 12? Yeah, 12 whole genome sequencing in, in this uh, uh, one chip. Okay. And uh, coming to the uh, NOAA 6000, they have actually three different running modes they have S1 chip, S2 chip, and S4 chip. So you can see they are all having different throughput. Uh, uh, but their price is different as well. Uh, so you, we have so far that uh, been using that for whole genome sequencing, for single cell RNA sequencing, for attack seq, for many different assays, for RNA sequencing, and once we can we can use this platform. And this is uh, a little bit cheaper than the high seq platform that I mentioned earlier. Okay, so that this is. Um, the, the Illumina sequencers. So now, next couple of slides, uh, I want to tell you the biochemistry principles of this uh, technology. So why they can sequence this fast? Okay, you can see that this is really, really smart. Um, in this, uh, the left panel, so you can see there is a major components that will include the gray DNA molecules. These are the nucleotides that you want to sequence. We don't know what the sequence is, okay? We want to sequence it. And then you are getting some of the purple ones or dark and light purples. They are the adapters of the DNA sequencing, okay? So the first reaction is uh, we want to put the adapters and uh, at the end of the, the DNA molecule we want to sequence. Okay, this is a very easy process uh, and to do. So once you finish this part, 
uh, keep in mind that the, the purple part of the sequence we know, but the gray part we don't. We, that's the part we want to get the sequence. And the next part is uh, you see this uh, flat surface. This is uh, like a glass. You can imagine this is more like a glass. Okay, those are the surface I'm, I'm showing you. I, sh I showed you. Those are the are the slides. So what you put here is in this. Uh, there is a bunch of uh, um, the the adapters, the Illumina adapters, the purple and the and the pink part of it, and occasionally you are seeing a few molecules that is uh, this uh, the, with the DNA sequence, the oligo you want to sequence. Okay, so if I put this into the analogy, it's like uh, you have a grass grassland, and then you are planting a few trees, and those trees are the DNA sequence you want to sequence. So that is uh, how it works. So first, uh, let's get in this settled on this chip, and then trying to figure out what the sequence is. Well, so then that comes to the first uh, uh, important part of the DNA sequencing is the amplification. The reason for that is uh, for each DNA molecule, the signal is too small, so we cannot reliably detect it. Therefore, we have to do the amplification. So the way we do that in the Illumina technology is called the bridge amplification. So what happens is uh, for each of the trees standing there, it can bind over and then touch another uh, reverse complement to another grass here, and then this is a form a bridge. And then you can see once it's formed, you can use a polymerase to really amplify this particular DNA molecule, original one, and then based on the template that we have. So after doing that, one will become two, and then you'll make them stand again, bend again, and then synthesize again. And this will be, um, for, from one you'll become two, two become four, and then you can amplify that. So by the end of the day, each tree that you initially have in the grass will become a little forest. That forest will have about 5,000 to 30,000 trees in this small forest. And, uh, but their sequences are identical. They were being made based on the template of the original single nucleotide that was standing there. So you can see there is become a cluster, cluster, a different cluster. They all become a forest. So now the amplification step is over, okay? So that's the first uh, uh, concept of Illumina sequencing, is a cluster generation by bridge amplification. Okay, that's uh, the, the purpose of that, again, is to making sure we have enough signals to do the sequencing. Now, next part will be sequencing. So once all this forest is standing there, all these trees are standing there, how do we detect the signals? So this is coming to the part that is very similar to cellular sequencing. We are going to put a, a lot of uh, colored nucleotide into this. This is a very much similar to the DDNTP that we are talking about. Okay, there are two modifications on the original D sequence, uh, the nucleotide. So the first one is uh, it has a label on the sequencing uh, uh, fluorescent, so you can read the signals uh, afterwards. The second one is that there is a stopper on that, so that you can the, the reaction will not happen. So you are making sure you put one nucleotide and one nucleotide only on this uh, continue to this reaction. Okay, but that stopper is removable. So once you finish the first cycle, you can remove the stopper, and then the, the nucleotide will further grow out of that. Okay, so let's go through the first step. What they do is uh, you, you, you put in a lot of those uh, colored DDNTP, a modified DDNTP in that. We, because of there's a stopper for every single nucleotide, you can only grow one nucleotide at a time. So you can see that uh, this is uh, maybe A, and then so every single molecule here is, uh, is green. 
being stop being put in there, and that is a T sequence. And then this is a, a originally template is a T, and then you can see the red one is coming there, and then C or G, so coming there. So at this step, you can think of every tree in the forest, you have a nucleotide being put there, and they're colorful, but they are representing what the next nucleotide was, right, on, on your original tree. At this point, you take a picture of this whole slide. We take a picture. That's why all these sequencers are so expensive, because they have a very, very high resolution um, cameras built in. And then you take a picture and say, oh, here is a, a green. I know this uh, nucleotide is a T, A, C, and G. So you, you know all this information. And then after doing that, I'm done with uh, the first base. Now I want to sequence the second base. And that's the part you want to biochemically remove the stopper sequence. So it's a very easy way to cut it off. So they, they made it that way, right? So you can cut off the stoppers. So now the DDNTP will become, the so-called DDNTP will become a DNTP. So the next uh, nucleotide will further grow based on that. So you can see that uh, after that, uh, there is another nucleotide come here with a different color because the base after that was a different nucleotide. So you can see all, all of them will give you a different color and now we are taking another picture. So you can see this is the first picture and then the second picture. You see here, there was an A, but the same spot for the next cycle, next picture become T, and then A, A, G, T. So by that, you will be able to know the sequence of each individual tree. Does that make sense? Okay, and uh, you can, the, the good news is that you really can do this in a massively parallel fashion. And that's why that we can do 10 billion, up to 10 billion of those trees in one single uh, experiment run. And, uh, and um, that, that is uh, how Illumina works in general. But I'm, I'm being simplified a little bit. And uh, there are different versions of Illumina sequencers. And uh, they are uh, historically, I mean, further evolved into how they can pack more, how, how they can sequence faster, how they can more, pack more nucleotides into that. And uh, the innovation they have after this is, uh, I'm showing you ACGT has four different colors, right? And they eventually put it into two different colors. G doesn't give you any color. And the C and the T, one give you green, one give you red. And A will have both two colors, give, give you yellow. So basically, you are able to just scan twice. You can know what the signals are. And that will increase uh, the, the, I mean, speed dramatically in term, during the reaction. And at the same time, make it faster. So that is one innovation they did, changing from two, four colors to two colors. And the second, I mean, making sure that the quality of the sequence or sequencing were not being sacrificed. The second innovation they did is, uh, is uh, I'm showing you this like a flat surface. They are actually not flat surface anymore. Initial version was. And then, but later, what they did is they put in a little bit of holes in those. And so this is actually a many holes. So each hole only have a nucleotide fall into it. And by that, you can pack your sequences in a denser format. And because you can place them where they want, you want them to be. And also you don't need to do the cluster identification because you already know where to search those. Okay? So, so this is a, the, a picture of uh, uh, ABI 3700, those are the workforce of the, whole, uh, of the Human Genome Project. And this is uh, the picture of Broad Institute uh, uh, at the end of the Human Genome Project. So each machine there is uh, one of those bigger machines uh, in terms of uh, doing the sequencing. 
And again, our platform here will have the equivalent to a few hundred million to a few billion of those sequencers in one sequencing run. So that's uh, how the technology is evolves. So the, this is uh, uh, all the uh, current uh, available platforms for the Illumina sequencers. So what we have here is um, we have the MySeq, we have the Nexic, we have the HiSeq, and we also have two NOAA se sequencers in our labs. Uh, I don't know whether we have time to see all of them, but because they are in two separate locations, but we can certainly make some arrangement. Any questions about the Illumina sequencing technology? So, so the major thing I want you to keep in mind is the major concept is the bridge amplification at the sequence by synthesis. So those are the two major points you need to know about the Illumina sequencers. Okay, so now I'm going to spend uh, two slides to very quickly go through the solid sequencing. Maybe one slide, I forgot. Um, so this is a sequencer that in the past I spent a lot of time talking about that, but because they are become obsolete, there's no reason for that. Uh, but at this point, you are still seeing a lot of data coming out of the solid sequencers are just ready to be published. So I think it's, it's uh, nice to know as an information, uh, informatics student, uh, and it's very uh, possible that you, you are have the opportunity to see some of the older data being generated. So I'm not going to go uh, a lot of detail about how they work, but there is uh, two things I want you to uh, just memorize. So in terms of, uh, it also have two things, the amplification and the base detection. And the amplification is using something called the emotion PCR, and then uh, the base detection is called the sequencing by ligation. Uh, if you look at my, my slides, I do have a few dozen slides that towards the very end of the lecture, I'm not going to go through. Those are the principles of the solid sequencing. If you're interested, in, I'll be happy to tell you after class, but we don't have time now. Um, for, the, for us, the most important part of the solid sequencer is the data format it become very, very difficult to, to look at. And because of the biochemistry they are doing, and it's not like a Illumina technology. We have four colors, and each color will give you A, C, G, or T. And for the solid, it become very confusing. Okay, just so follow me on that. A, A, C, C, G, G, T, T. This dinucleotide, this is four type dinucleotides, they are using the same color, which is blue in this case. Well, C, A, A, C, and uh, G, so what, what is this? Okay, C, A, A, C, G, T, T, G, they are using green. So basically, they still have four colors, but those four colors will represent 16 type of uh, dinucleotides. And uh, by the end of the day, we call it the color space. And uh, instead of representing that, them as ACGT, we represent them as 0, 1, 2, 3. But once you have one number or one color, you do not know which sequence, which nucleotide you, you just detected. It has to be, depends on the previous one, okay? If the previous one is uh, C, and then if you get a green, you know your current one is A. But if your previous one is A, you know, if you got a green, you know your sequence is C. So it's becoming very, very confusing and the data analysis is very, very difficult. But they are trying to, to sell in the way that each base is being interrogated twice. And because of the chemistry, they, they went through. So the, the detection is, uh, is more accurate. It, it turns out I, I haven't seen the increased uh, uh, level of accuracy. And, uh, but I do see the data interpretation is very challenging and confusing. I think that is a part of the reason they are going away from the market. Okay, and uh, now once I talk about the 454 technology, and I'm not going to go into any detail because it's another obsolete technology. So basically you can imagine that we have a flat surface, but they are not. They have a lot of little holes, and each hole here is a, a bead that carried a nucleotide here. 
And, uh, and actually, they carry many, many nucleotides in the, after amplification. So the chemistry, what they are using here is uh, they are using this uh, particular enzyme that has uh, this uh, um, sulfurylase and uh, luciferase. So what happens is uh, if you put this uh, nucleotide uh, based on the polymerase, you put anything on it, it will release uh, ATP. And that ATP will lighten up the luciferase. So if you see that uh, this is a T. If when you flush the system with A, with everything is A, okay? And then at this point, uh, for whichever bead that have a T in the next nucleotide, it will shine up, okay? Because of uh, this reaction will happen and it will release the ATP and further will lighten up the, the, the sequence, the, uh, the molecule. And this is uh, another one, which is a Pacific Bioscience technology. This technology is still very actively being used. And uh, they also call it single molecule real-time technology. And the way to think about that is uh, this is also a chip and uh, with uh, many little holes on that. And each hole is about 100 nanometer in diagonal. And then, so basically in each hole, you can imagine that uh, there is a polymerase sitting there, and that polymerase can lighten up. If you catch the nucleotide, you can do the synthesis. Okay, so that's how they engineer this polymerase. So what happens is uh, you are flushing the system with A, for example. Okay, whichever hole has a T in the next nucleotide will catch up a T, catch up a A, and then put that on the nucleotide, and then that uh, polymerase will lighten up. So when you measure it, you will see that uh, occasionally when you flush C here, and then you see this one goes up, the signal being detected, you know that base has a G in that base because, uh, I mean, the, the, the uh, the hybrid, I mean, the, the nucleotide is, is going to be uh, synthesized based on that. So, so that is uh, the pack biotechnology. You can see they are all based on very different uh, biochemistry reactions, but by the end of the day, they all make sense. This technology will give you very, very long sequencing reads and, uh, and uh, reasonably high quality. And they can go pretty long and it can reach 60 thousand bases and uh, and it's uh, so so there's a lot of advantage of this um, but it's still comparing to illumina technology the sequencing quality is not very high you still have a, a significant amount of error rate for this particular technology okay um, and the next one I want to go through is something called the iron semiconductor-based technology. This is also iron torrent and iron proton technologies. And you can see that what you start with is a surface like this. Again, there's a lot of little holes in that, right? And what they are based on, the principle is once the DNA polymerase catch a nucleotide to do the synthesis based on a template, it will release a hydrogen ion, which is a proton. That's why it's called M proton technology. And this hydrogen ion being released will change the local pH value. Okay? And then what happens is uh, when you, after you amplify this DNA within this plate, and, and actually it's bead based, so that's, that's fine. And then if you flush the system with A, for example, so everywhere the next nucleotide is a T, you will grab the A, do the synthesis, but more importantly, release that hydrogen ion, change the local pH, and then they have the sensor underneath to detect those pH changes. Okay, so that principle is going to, you will use that principle, you will be able to figure out the sequencing. And then you flush the system with A, and then see which one changed, and C, 
to see which one change G and T and, and so on and so forth. So after a few cycles, hundred cycles of this, you will know what the sequence uh, look like. Um, so the real sequence uh, they put in is not really just uh, uh, A, C, G, T in that order. Rather, they will have their own uh, sequential flood of DNTP based on the protocol. But you can see that uh, sometimes uh, for this space, if I have two A's here, and then you are seeing the signal will be doubled. For this one, we'll have three A's, for example, it will be tripled. So based on this type of uh, data analysis, you will be able to figure out what the sequence are. It's very, very smart. One other uh, part I want to mention about this technology, comparing to what we talk about, the, the Illumina, the solid, and uh, uh, the pack bio and 454. For those four technologies, there's a common part. Is uh, by the end of the day, the detection is uh, the imaging based. So you need to take a picture to see which part is lightened up and then which part is what color. So they are all camera based technology. And the exception is for this one, for this technology, the, the detection is based on the semiconductor, it's electronic based. So that makes the entire platform much, much cheaper and uh, afford, uh, you, you can afford that. Uh, and you don't need to readjust the system uh, over many, many times. Okay? And uh, the last sequencing technology I want to mention is called nanopore sequencers. A lot of people refer to this as uh, the future of the, the sequencing technology. So um, this is really borrowed the idea of our cell membranes. So we, we know we have double uh, uh, layers of the, um, uh, the molecules that will isolate the inside of a cell from the outside. And then we also know that uh, there is an electrical potential that between the inside and outside of cells that help to make the cells active. And the inside and outside of the cells, uh, the regular molecules are not passing through except for through those uh, molecules called uh, uh, transmembrane proteins, right? And then some of the, the iron channel proteins. So you can see this is very much like the same idea. And then you are creating this uh, particular layer that separates the inside and outside, but you put a, a protein engineered as a, a so-called nanopore protein across it. And there's a little hole in that, but you can think it through that uh, for this one, the, when the hole is small enough, you can detect the electrical current, current across this hole, right? If inside and outside the electrical potential is different. Okay, so that is uh, the base of this. When you do the sequencing, you have another, another protein that is sitting on top of it. Grab the DNA you want to sequence and then throw it down the hole. Just grab it, throw it down the hole. We know A, C, G, T. They have different sizes. Okay? And uh, this hole is small enough that uh, when the size of those ACGT are different, it will cause the electrical disturbance. The current will shift slightly. Depends on you passing through an A, C, G, or T. Okay, I'm only giving you the simplified version, but in reality, what they do is they have five nucleotides as a unit, and then to detect the, the current change and then move one nucleotide further, and then the next five nucleotides, and then to detect the changes. But the general principle is uh, when the molecule that's going through this nucleotide, the size varies, it will change the way that uh, electronic signals are being profiled. And this is, they have different, uh, slightly different chemistry. But just based on this simple uh, principle, you will be able to sequence uh, a very, very long molecule using this uh, um, one nanopore protein. Okay. So what I'm going to show you is uh, what the, the sequencer looks like. This is the only sequencer I can carry to here.
So you can see that this is uh, the sequencer itself, okay? And then there is a, a electronic port you can plug in, and the other end will plug into your the USB of your computer, okay? And then if you open this, how do I focus on this? If you open this, so far this is a fake. So this is not a flow cell. This is just a something that is, a, is a holding the spot here. And then well, the real flow cell look like this. Look like this. So basically, you remove this, you put the, this, is, this is normally, before it's used, it's being frozen in the freezers. And then once you thaw it properly, and then you just load your samples into this, uh, uh, this whole thing, and then put in that, and plug into your computer, and then the signals start to flow out. Okay, so this is a, a really a neat design, and uh, and so far, I mean, of course, there there is a problem with this technology. The error rate is very very high. In our hand, the accuracy is about eight eight percent. So meaning that you still have twelve percent that are are wrong, uh, but. Uh, so that is not good enough to do the genotyping, but it's, uh, it's good for a lot of other applications to figure out uh, what are the bacterial species are in there and whether there is a virus infection and those type of applications. Um, so let me go back to uh, my slides. And uh, so there is a, the article talking about this, and this is uh, uh, during the Ebola and Zika virus outbreak. And uh, it's really, really hard that you take a Illumina sequencer to the middle of Africa and set up a lab over there to detect the Ebola outbreak. They don't even have electricity over there, okay? So, so what this is published in the Nature article. These are the figures in Nature. This is the first time I see figure like that in Nature. Um, but you can see they have to put in these uh, uh, generators, and there's a there's a laptop that they carried with them. This is the entire lab. So, so they were able to quickly assemble this uh, mobile lab in the middle of Africa and then start to detect the Ebola outbreak. And I think they were able to do that for Zika virus as well in, in South America. Um, and uh, so this technology apparently has a lot of potentials in the future. And once they can uh, increase their accuracy uh, a little bit more. OK, so, so that is uh, most of the, the component I want to uh, talk about today. So basically, I, I, what I want to deliver here is uh, None of those sequencers are a magic, a, a magic box that uh, you send your samples in and some people, something will happen and then you get a sequence. They all based on the real biochemistry principles and reactions. And, um, and uh, it, I think if you're innovative enough and that there may be something to be improved on top of it as well. I know many companies are working on the long range uh, sequencing so far, most of the the accurate ones are still short range, but uh, but uh, I, I think that will soon come in, uh, along. So in the next couple of minutes, I want to introduce uh, uh, our sequencing, our our campus capacity to do those genomic sequencing, and uh, that is through the Center for Medical Genomics. And uh, there are a couple of different type of uh, service that we offer, including the sequencing, the single cell analytics. Uh, microarray and the genotyping technologies. This is a statement. Um, so the, the machine we have is, uh, um, we have six next generation sequencing technologies or machines. So the first one is uh, the Nexic 500. This will give you about uh, 400 million reads per uh, sequencing run. And, uh, and this uh, is good enough for about 12 RNA sequencing samples or eight whole exome sequencing samples. So I'm, I'm going to show you what the, the slides look like. So 
That's my shoe. It's not that I want to show you. So this is a, how to make it focus. Well, how to make it focus. OK, it's getting better. I don't know how that worked. Um, but you see, that this is uh, the flat surface. And the DC sequencer is a two-color sequencer, and it's a flat surface. So it's a, it's a combination of different combinations of illumina sequencing technology. So these are four different lanes. Actually, this is one lane, and, the, and the, they are connected. So it's not uh, considered as independent uh, experimental units. And this will give you about 400 million rates in that uh, instrument run. And then we have uh, the big brother, uh, which is a uh, high seq 4000. This will give you 330 million rates and uh, with eight lanes. So that means it's about 2.5 billion rates per run. And it's good enough for about 100 RNA sequencing samples in one run. And uh, the life. Uh, technology and um, proton sequencers uh, we do have in our center as well and uh, and uh, it will look like this and uh, nothing fancy but it give you about 180 to 100 million rates and uh, normally we use that for the microRNA sequencing and we also have this uh, nanopore sequencers um, recently acquired two NOAA seq uh, 6000 sequencing instrument and this will give us uh, about 1.6 billion to 10 billion rates per flow cell. And our capacity is about, we can sequence 200 whole genomes in a week. But in addition to that, we also have uh, one smaller sequencer, which is a uh, MySeq. And this is uh, good for clinical applications. It's really give you a very long rates. It's a, for the other sequencers, it's about 2 by 150. And for this one, it's a 300 cycle, so in at one end. So this is a good for a lot of clinical grade detections, as well as metagenomic sequencing. And we also have this uh, single cell uh, instrument, which is a 10 times 10x genomics. And uh, this is a very small instrument. Right? I couldn't believe I spent $100,000 on this. When they were being delivered, I felt like this is just a toaster. Um, and th this is my hand, so you have the, my watch to prove that. So you can see how small th this is. But it, it turns out to be really powerful. It can help you to sequence uh, about 10,000 cells. And uh, for each cell separately for the, for the gene expression analysis. So by the end of the day, for each sample, you are not only expecting you have uh, 20,000 genes being figured out. Rather, you have 20,000 genes and 10,000 cells. That is the amount of information you are going to get. We are still trying to learn how to deal with the data analysis. And we, are, we will have one lecture fully devoted to the uh, single cell. And I think if you really want to learn this well, this alone will take the whole semester to do the single cell data analysis. But I guess we'll do that somewhere in the future about those course. Uh, and uh, for this technology, the good, good thing is uh, it not only can do the single cell RNA sequencing, it also can do the VDJ segmentation detections. Uh, it's very, very important in the uh, immunotherapy, uh, uh, um, in the cancer uh, 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 genomics. And also it can do the long range DNA sequencing, including whole genome and whole exome sequencing. So at one point we'll talk about that in a little more detail. Um, so with all these toys, there's many different assets that we can do. And we are doing the whole uh, genomic DNA sequencing that will include the whole genome sequencing, whole exome sequencing. And those are the concepts that we'll talk about in the next lecture and the target is sequencing as well. And we can do the RNA sequencing with the sample that uh, both mRNA sequencing messenger alone or total RNA. And then there is some assays specifically for very degraded samples, like FLPE samples. And we also do quite a bit of the, the microRNA sequencing as well. 
So those RNA can be from cells, from tissues, from laser captured or FLPs, which means normally you get a very, very small amount of RNA with very, very, uh, very much degraded. So we can still get a very uh, reliable signal. And we will also talk, uh, we, can, we, we have been doing a lot of ChIP-seq, ClipSeq. ClipSeq is uh, the RNA version of the ChIP-seq and ATAC-seq. And uh, those are uh, some of newer assays that measure the chromatin accessibilities. And it has become very, very important in epigenetic studies. And, uh, and Dr. Jun Wan just uh, uh, joined us. He will be talking about those towards the very end of the course. Uh, how to deal with the data analysis. We also do a lot of DNA methylation studies that will include uh, the methyl capture by sulfide-based sequencing, which we'll get into a little bit in the future, and uh, uh, reduce the library by sulfide sequencing as well as uh, capture-based methylation sequencing. We are doing a lot on the metagenomic studies, including the 16S, and those are the back. I mean, the, the ribosome um, part of the, the bacterial genomes. And based on that, we can identify the identities of the, uh, the, the bacteria. And the shotgun sequencing, which means not only focus on the 16S, and, but also focus on all the DNA molecule in, in those metagenomes. We'll have one lecture devoted for metagenomics. And the, these machines can have also do the immunology by looking at uh, the, the uh, VDJ segmentation detections. And we also uh, uh, have done quite a lot of uh, assays on the, on the assay and technology development, and including the, so basically, uh, some of our personnel uh, in the Center for Medical Genomics help our investigators to design different type of assays if there's no standard protocols available like a various insertion site detection, and those are super, super important, and we are trying to extend that to further like a, uh, identify the CRISPR off-target, and that, that is fully capable of doing that. Um, CRISPR screening, high throughput report assay, which uh, this year we'll add uh, in one lecture about that. Dr. Xi Rao will give the lecture. And, uh, and the 4C seq that's part of the chromosome confirmation assays, uh, and, uh, and also nanocore sequencer, sequencing. So just a few data slides as so you can see that this is based on uh, RNA sample we got from FFP samples, very much degraded. The ring number is like a two. And then it's a very small amount, total RNA about 10, 20 nanogram. But what we can get is uh, after doing this assay, you can see those are, this is a, a one gene, and those are the axons. So you can see that we have detected a huge amount of signal, very sharp signals from the axons, and a lot of those sequences are across the different junctions, so indicating we're detecting the mature messenger RNAs. And we have been doing the long, low input RNA sequencing, and this is a, a titration run that we know the answer. We want to see whether we can recover the answer. So basically, these are two different cell lines. One is being processed as a bulk, that but we take about 10 nanograms of total RNA. So you can see there's a difference. And then we take only 10 picogram of total RNA, or we do it in the single cell level. So you can see there is a batch effect in the, for sure, because uh, I mean, the protocol are slightly different. But you can see clearly the general trend, the sequence, the, the global gene expression patterns are being uh, identified and preserved. This is the attack seek. So this is uh, the part that uh, Jim will uh, give a lot more detailed introduction, that uh, trying to measure which par part of the chromatin is opened. And um, so you can see here is uh, those are the genes and normally, in the beginning of the gene, you will see a strong peak. Why is that? Those are the promoter regions. And uh, when the transcription being active, the promoter regions are more active so that enzyme can get in to do the detection. 
And uh, if we zoom in so you can see across different conditions, you are seeing different level of uh, chromatin open or close. If you further look at the detail, so you can see those are the same region across the four samples. Somehow the control and treatment, there is a difference between these two. And the difference is here, there is a big hole here. Why is that? Because in this treatment, there is a transcription factor come here to bind and then stop the, the, the enzyme to cut it through. So you can see, based on this footprint, we can understand uh, a little more biology about transcription factor binding. These data are super helpful and useful so that we can also detect uh, the genetic variants in the regulatory region using these assays. The DNA methylation, so you can see there is a uh, uh, most of the, the bisulfide base, the most of the C are being converted to T after bisulfide treatment, but at a certain point, this C, for example, is not being converted. Why? Because this C has been methylated, so it protects the bisulfide from doing the work. And therefore, you can, based on this level, you can measure the, the DNA methylation signals. And this is a the single cell RNA sequencing. This is one of the samples that we got from a, a tumor that uh, most focus on immune component. But you can see that if we further look at this, there's a B cells, there is a macrophages, there's a monocytes, there's a stem cells, there's a, a cancer cell, there's a fibroblast, which is a mo most likely stroma cells, NK cell, and so on and so forth. So the idea is that once you sequence a tumor, in the past, we got a tumor, we grind it, we sequence it. Uh, but that is not only for cancer, right? For that tumor, you have cancer cells, you have normal cells, you have stroma cells, you have immune component, you have everything. So based on this data, right, you, you really grind it, you really don't, you are not measuring the tumor. You are measuring the microenvironment and everything surrounding this. I think single cell technology will help us to solve this problem, uh, hopefully. And this is uh, how we transfer the data, which will, most of the, the action will be in the supercomputer system that, uh, uh, that we have to use, and otherwise there's no way to go through all the data analysis. Okay. Uh, next lecture, we'll continue about uh, the overview part, and uh, I will go through the major biological applications that can use the, the next generation sequencing technology. I'll give a few basic concepts and also uh, talk about uh, some of the scientific breakthroughs that were enabled by this technology. Okay. Um, so I do have uh, additional slides on the solid sequencing. If, if you are interested, you are well, more than welcome to go, go over that. Any questions? I did perfect on time. It's 4.30. All right, thank you very much. Yeah. Should I do done?